Yeah, thanks. Um, so hello, everybody. Um, I am Tiffany Wang. I'm a customer reliability engineer here at WeWorks. And today, what I'm going to be discussing with you all is customer perspectives on GitOps. I've included a brief agenda overview to highlight some of the topics that I'll be discussing today. Um, and you'll notice that I'm focusing quite a bit on the automotive mastermind GitOps experience. Um, I'll be talking about uh, the journey to GitOps there, and I will also be talking about some customer observations regarding GitOps. So I'll start with a brief introduction to Automotive Mastermind, and it's a company that provides software as a service products for predictive analytics and marketing automation solutions, targeting car dealerships and car manufacturers. There are also some consumer facing products as well. Automotive Mastermind has been a WeWorks customer since 2017, and it was acquired in, by IHS Market in 2017 as well. And just as a quick disclaimer, I was a software engineer at Automotive Mastermind between 2017 um, and into 2019. And what I'll be speaking to today is perhaps not the latest technology and architecture of Automotive Mastermind, but rather the beginnings of the GitOps journey and the microservices architecture journey. I was one of the three initial engineers that were working on these efforts. So I'll provide a bit of color. So in, in talking about um, the journey, I think it's important to start with what technology um, existed before we rolled out our Greenfield microservice architecture. And the original application was monolithic in nature. So you might be seeing this and you might be thinking, ah, legacy code. And you wouldn't be wrong, but before, but I think that any um, original or legacy solutions uh, deserve certainly recognition and respect because they were essentially the right solution at the right time and the foundation of the company's success. However, there were some major pain points um, and with monolithic architecture, you have tightly coupled code and any minor changes that you seek to make to your applications could easily produce major bugs. And any small changes that you seek to deploy requires deployment of the entire application. This deeply affects developer velocity, especially if you have a definition of done that includes not only the feature to be code complete, but for that feature to be deployed successfully. So we sought to implement a microservice architecture, and it was initially a proof of concept and powered by a very small team. Um, but there are some major benefits to using microservices, and specifically writing business domain based microservices. You're able to easily deploy small features, and those microservices can be deployed and deployed and updated independently of each other. And this could cut down on develop, sorry, uh, cut down on time to deployment and improve developer velocity as well as the release process. But with microservice architecture, there's a lot more components to keep track of and additional complexity that's introduced. And so we look to GitOps. <clears throat> As I talk about our journey, uh, Automotive Mastermind's journey to GitOps, I'd like to first point out some of the decisions that we made. We decided to use Docker for containerization, Kubernetes as the orchestrator, and when we first started on this project, um, Kubernetes was arguably in its early days. Um, and as the cloud platform provider, we decided to go with Google and specifically the Google's Kubernetes engine for managed Kubernetes. I'll be focusing today's talk on, an, uh, on the GitOps perspective from application developers, 
But I wanted to mention here that for cluster provisioning and infrastructure management, we use Terraform for infrastructure as code. I've heard that they were this was ac accomplished originally using JavaScripts, but I'll highlight here that declared declaratively des, um, describing desired state was a cornerstone of our journey to GitOps. So I'll start by introducing the continue, continuous integration portion of our journey. Automotive Mastermind had a lot of C Sharp developers and while microservices ended up being written in um, different languages. Uh, this was the, um, the many of the microservices that we wrote were .NET Core. Um, and they were pretty similar in form and function, of course, with different schemas and different business logic. But essentially, they included a REST API. And later on, we also introduced event-driven architecture using Cloud PubSub from Google. And as our source control management, we used Azure repositories. For our build pipelines and CI pipelines, we used Azure pipelines, and we ensured that they were immutable from the start. We were declaratively describing the pipelines and making sure that it was all tracked in Git. Our build system then was a, an open source project under the Automotive Mastermind brand called Condo. And with this build system, we were able to ensure that we were running tests. Um, we used a changelog based semantic version uh, since we very strictly adhered to conventional commits. Uh, this tag was then used, sorry, this semantic, semantic version then was used as we built and pushed NuGet artifacts to NuGet feeds um, and also used to tag our Docker images. As with the pipelines, our images were immutable and pushed ultimately to Google Cloud Registry. So then I'd like to talk about our continuous delivery journey. It started out with our with a Git repository that we contributed our Kubernetes manifests to. We initially wrote a custom tool to monitor this repository and ensure that we were only applying resources from this repository. However, we were missing a few things that we wanted to make sure we had, including a monitor of our image registry. And we also didn't have a solution for reconciliation. And then we discovered we flux. Um, one thing that I'll note here is while is throughout the today's talk, um, I'm going to be referencing flux v1. But flux v1 was supremely powerful and very simple and very elegant. And what it enabled us to do was let it let us monitor our deployment repository and monitored our GCR image registry. And it also was able to write back to the deployment repository with any updated images that it saw. We also were very excited to be able to use the Flux CD Helm operator. And what this enabled us to do was abstract away a lot of the complexities of Kubernetes um, and deployment by creating a microservice Helm chart. You can imagine that um, an application is not comprised only of a deployment, but also resources such as horizontal pod autoscalers, services, ingresses, and the like. So we replaced our handwritten Kubernetes manifests with a very simple Helm release that was easily understood by application developers. We also were very excited to be able to use Weave Cloud and there are a lot of great features in Weave Cloud, but some of the ones that I'll highlight here in this slide include the ability that you're, you have to compare what is deployed 
in each cluster and compare the versions against what you have in your image registry. And it was also very easy to compare clusters against each other. So you could very easily see what versions you had in dev, what versions you had in stage, what versions you had in prod. Weave Cloud also allowed us to utilize the one-click promotion button. <laughs> and this would effectively allow us to automatically deploy to a, our target environments. I'll speak um, in a bit more depth as to the promotion between dev, stage, and prod in the next slide. But another huge benefit of using Weave Cloud was hosted Prometheus. We were able to gather um, enhanced metrics and store them without having to figure out how to deploy Cortex on our own. So when you put those CI and CD portions together, what do you get? Well, you get something that might look like this. And this was our development to deployment GitOps workflow. So on the left-hand side, you'll see you know, the typical dev writing application code, committing that code to the application code repository. And one of the major benefits of GitOps is that you get an automatic audit trail. You can very easily see who committed what, when, who approved it. And this helps to um, make it very clear the separation of responsibilities. As I briefly mentioned before, we then used Azure pipelines and the end of the pipeline was the Docker image push to our GCR. On the right hand side, you see components of our continuous delivery. I've purposefully not added arrows because um, one, Flux, um, Flux um, is involved at each of these stages in that it is monitoring the Google Cloud registry and you'll notice that I have a block um, listed here for our de deployment repository. The way that we structured our deployment repository was to have separate branches per cluster or environment. I've only listed um, dev, staging, and prod here, but later in our journey, we did end up creating separate clusters for each team. So we had an instance of Flux in each environment, and that instance of Flux was set up to monitor its respective cluster branch. Flux also informed Weave Cloud, and I've just made a note here that it provided visibility into not only the different environments, but also the image registry, and provided us the ability to automatically have access to monitoring and logging with Prometheus metrics and uh, Weave Cloud notebooks so that you could write some PromQL queries very quickly um, when triaging or investigating any issues that might be happening. As I mentioned in the previous slide, Weave Cloud also allowed for us to use one-click deployments to any given environment. And the way that we set up some gates for deployment to more sensitive environments like st stage and certainly prod was the fact that we had list um, we had several privileged Weave Cloud users um, who were given access to click those buttons. So next, I'll talk a little bit about our release process or what the release process looked like without GitOps. We had release party concepts, um, and I'm not sure if any of you on the call have experienced these, but while it's called a release party, it's not quite a party. It does involve late night, um, late night deployments, uh, which needed to happen because that's when the fewest amount of users would be impacted and we also had big bang deployments where many features were rolled out in each release and they either all successfully deployed together or all were rolled back together. 
this did make for some lengthy release cycles. So it would be eight to 10 weeks um, in, be in between times when new features could be released. Our releases with GitOps then could ha happen automatically shortly after the PRs compete complete and the promotion from dev to stage to production environments um, were gated by Weave Cloud users and their privilege. But there was also the possibility of making commits to the deployment repositories themselves. If you're familiar with the way that Flux works, um, you might know that you can set up annotations to automatically deploy upon um, updated image tags, but you can also very easily make the simple um, commit to update a, an application's image tag. This allowed us to have reliable, re reproducible deployments and rolling back was very simple. If I'm not mistaken, there was a, um, a rollback option as well. And this ultimately allowed us to have 10 to 100 deployments per day across all of our microservices. So I've got some customer observations regarding GitOps now that I've had the privilege of working with several co uh, customers as a CRE at WeWorks. And the first thing that I'll mention here is how GitOps impacts engineering teams. I found that it works well for distributed teams, um, you know, particularly because there is a single source of truth for a desired state, and that is described declaratively. This prevents any need for clicking in the console to create resources or directly cube cuddle apply, which I'm sure some of you on the call have had experience with. Um, this creates for easily um, confused state and by making sure that everything that you want to deploy is described in Git, you have a reliable repro reproducible system for deployments and for cluster management. Thanks. Developers are also empowered with GitOps. All developers are familiar with Git and so developers can stay in their workflow. Developer velocity also can be drastically improved. Features can be put out um, at a much quicker pace. And if you break down stories into smaller features that are easily, um, easily uh, testable and not so complex, you can roll out features more frequently and with GitOps, developers can also take on DevOps and SRE roles. I mentioned before that there, we used things like Prometheus metrics. Um, I mentioned that there's notebooks for um, any PromQL queries that you might want to write to investigate any issues. Um, and Grafana is also another great tool for, uh, for monitoring and observability. So what are the benefits of GitOps? I mentioned the benefit of the automated, automatic audit trail, frequent automated deployments, your mean time to deployment is greatly reduced and your mean time to recovery is reduced. Um, and in my experience, that can be, you know, what once took days or hours can be reduced to minutes because everything is declaratively described and stored in Git. And I think I'm out of time now, but observability is also a major benefit. So I'd like to thank you all for your time and I'll share slides at the end. I've included a link to the automotive mastermind case study and please do stick around for all the rest of our great GitOps days talks.